Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Marion Widener and I'm the chair of Audubon Chapter of Minneapolis. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who tuned in tonight, especially those of you who are joining for the first time. We are excited you're here and look forward to seeing you again at our future programs. This program is being recorded, as you may have heard, and will be available on our chapter's YouTube channel. You can share it with others who weren't able to make it or rewatch uh, parts that you want to see again. And at the end of the presentation, we will field as many questions as time allows. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A function that's at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And tonight we are very lucky to have our board secretary, Izzy Wild, here as the Q&A moderator. She has a degree in city planning and is currently pursuing her master's in landscape architecture at the University of Minnesota. So please stick around for what I expect will be a very interesting and informative Q&A. Tonight, I am very pleased and honored to introduce our presenter, Frank Wischke. Frank is the owner of the Native Plant uh, Nursery Shelterwood Gardens. It's located in uh, Minnesota, Minnesota. And as a nationally exhibiting uh, landscape focused artist, Frank has been an artist in residence at Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve, McDowell Colony, um, Weir Farm National Historic Park, and has been awarded the Minnesota State Arts Board Grants in uh, multiple years. He shows with the Cooperative Gallery Rosa Lux and teaches drawing and photography at MCAD, painting at uh, Chautauqua University, excuse me, Institute in New York, and he manages photography programs at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So please give uh, a warm and silent welcome to Frank. And without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you. I'm imagining hearing the crowds roar. So uh, thanks for having me tonight. I have a ton of slides to share with you. So I probably should just get right into it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, there it is. Gotcha. Okay. There we go. How's it look? Looks good. Take that. Okay, great. So as you said, my name's uh, Frank James Moika. I've got a ton of slides and I'm gonna try to speak slowly for you. Um, I do own Shelterwood Gardens. This is going to be our fourth season. Um, we are in Minnetrista, Minnesota, which if you don't know where that is, imagine you're going to South Dakota and after a half an hour leaving Minneapolis, you stopped. That's where we are. So we're in the West Metro, uh, fairly close to the edge of Hennepin, Hennepin County. Uh, website is shelterwoodgardens.com. Easy to remember. Email is shelterwoodgardens at gmail.com. And if you ever want to ask me a question, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Okay, so um, what is going on here? There we go. Okay. Face, I don't need to see me. Um, so our hours for the spring. Uh, as you see, it's, well, at least to here, it's still uh, pretty deep snow and still pretty cold. And you never know what you're going to get in the Minnesota spring. Uh, tried to open earlier last year, and it didn't happen until May. And I have a feeling it's going to be the same this year. But I, I'm so I'm looking forward to around the May 1st opening. Um, we'll have regular hours, and you can always email me for an appointment if you got, you know, you want to spend extra time with me. I, I do like to spend time with the customers. Um, however, I am pretty much the only person who is around, so it's really great when you come early or, or um, just find time where things aren't busy if you have a lot of questions. It doesn't want me to use that, so I'll use this. So I'm going to jump right into it. Now, the last time I gave this talk, uh, I was at my gallery. We had a climate scientist named Sam Potter with us, and he spent about an hour talking about climate change 
in Minnesota. I'm not going to do that, but I did glean a few things from him, and I, I think these are worth going over. Um, the first important thing is that winters are warming. You may know this. This winter has been like that, right? We had rain uh, in January. We had rain in February. Um, we should expect more of that and generally less snow cover overall. We should expect that there be, might be less snow on, on the two ends of winter, beginning and end, and of, across the middle. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be less wet, just that it might be more rain instead of snow. Um, of course, there is a potential for a wetter winter and spring. Last spring was very wet by most standards. Of course, there's going to be more summers like 2022, which really was sort of like a perfect signal of climate change. Not that it was caused by climate change, but it's the kind of summer you might imagine. Um, so it's hot, long heat wave, and, and a severe drought. Those are all more possible in climate change in our area. Heavy thunderstorm precipitation is going to be more common. So one inch definitely, um, two, three, even four plus inch events are going to be more possible given the increased amount of moisture in the air. Potential for higher winds over longer periods. And of course, uh, last year was a very, uh, I'm not sure it was a record wind year, but it was close if it wasn't. Um, and that, of course, if it's droughty and hot, makes things a lot worse for plants. And this is important to note that climate extremes in Minnesota, as you know, as Minnesotans, are not considered aberrations. They're just inherent to the, our particular location, the sweet spot in the middle of the continental United States. Um, so we have extremes here. Minnesota is one of the most extreme you know, climates. It could be minus 40 or it could be 105. Uh, that's a lot of range. And that range, sometimes the temperature could drop 75 degrees in 24 hours. Um, so it is a, a very extreme environment. It's just that the climate changes that that uh, we're anticipating over the next 100 years um, just might make these extremes greater and um, sort of the the uh, flux of them more common, you know, the, the shifts more common, swinging a little bit more wildly. So this graph is probably one of the more important ones for people who love winter and winter uh, recreation. Right, so our minimum temperatures are going up, which is almost sounds, you know, sort of counterintuitive. Um, the, the lowest temperatures are higher than they used to be. This is one of the one uh, sets of data where it's the, the record is really clear from 1896 to 2022. Um, it's just been a steady trend upward. And over the last um, 40 years or so, the, the 10 warmest uh, minimums occurred and that's represented by those red dots so that's one big change that is is already in motion um, now the minimum temperature uh, for may through september so basically our outdoor season, our warm season um, is going up right you see that right there um, it was subtly going up uh, between 1900 and 1960 but now it's it's sort of going up quite a bit more dr dramatically so what that means is those hot often really sticky, humid nights with a high dew point. Um, that makes it a lot harder for plants to recover from the heat of the day when, it, when it's like that, when it doesn't cool down as much. And so that's a significant change. I mean, that's a pretty big graph. So here we have May through September for the maximum temperatures. And you can see that those haven't, uh, they've gotten, they're going up, but not quite as uh, dramatically. So the upper level highs, not as high as the upper level lows. Uh, with the exception of that period, you'll always see that spike on all kinds of data charts uh, during the Dust Bowl years of the 30s, um, where, you know, there's sort of a feedback loop. When you get drought, you see, see gets more drought, it makes things drier, it makes things hotter, and, and sort of accumulates and becomes a really big spike like you see here in the graph. Uh, the average temperature, um, Twin Cities, May through September, also going up. So that's just the average temperature over that whole period, not the average high and average low, but just the general overall average temperature also going up. Now, these aren't futures. These are right now. This is the record for, you know, for the last hundred years that you're looking at. Another important change is our precipitation. In the wintertime, you'll see there has been a subtle 
increase, I'm sorry, this is not the winter time. This is, I always read that backwards. This is January through December. This is the, the overall whole year of precipitation. So there's a general trend upward uh, in, in that as well since about the, the middle, middle 70s. All right, so we're getting more precipitation now than we were in the you know, first half of the 20th century. And we have for quite some time. But the winter time, November to March, it's only very slightly higher, you know, almost almost non-existent. Um, and so that's important to note that the winter is Minnesota's dry season. Uh, historically, only eight or 10% of the moisture in a year falls in winter. This winter has been a wetter one. And um, so this is unusual. Usually, uh, you know, we get two inch snows and that kind of thing spread out over the, over the year. I'm sorry, over the winter. Um, so you can see there isn't much change there. But May through September, again, the summertime, we get, again, that increase since about the mid-70s to late 80s. So there's been lots of uh, increases there already happening. We're anticipating that that precipitation in summertime is going to increase, right? So thunderstorm precipitation accounts for roughly one half of our annual total of, of rainfall. And... That's significant because, as you know, um, when you get thunderstorm rains, it's not a broad sort of, what do you call it, a shield of rain. It's hit or miss, right? So in this storm of this radar picture here, and I'm that blue circle, um, we really didn't get any rain because it was moving southwest, northeast, and we were sort of in the, in the clear spot. That happens a lot. Um, so even though it might be raining a lot in your neighboring town, you might not be getting any rain and might be stuck in a drought, whereas your neighboring town might be seeing it, it getting a little bit better. Last May 12th um, was a particular uh, storm that we had here. This was the setup, this, this image, if you're probably wondering what this is that we're looking at. So it, this is an image of the wind and convective potential on that particular day. And so the white lines are winds and they're coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and the red and orange is convective potential, which is sort of the potential heat, moisture and uplift and so on. So that it creates thunderstorms. And if you remember May 12th, as much as I do, you uh, we were in the basement for uh, two tornado warnings uh, last May 12th. And uh, that was fun. Not very. I mean, we get tornado warnings every now and then, but certainly not two in one night. And and um, what ended up happening was not so much a wind problem as a rain problem. So these are the rainfall gauges in our area. We're about where that X is, and as you can see, just to our west, there's three and a half inches, four inches. This was over about an hour, an hour and a half period of time. That, that much rain fell. I mean, in, to the east in Hennepin, eastern Hennepin County, you can see it's over one inches. That's still a lot of rain in that period of time. Certainly uh, something that the landscape usually can deal with. But once you get into the two, three, four inch zone in a very short period of time, it can be really bad for home landscapes, natural landscapes, sewers, everything. Um, there's a lot of rain gauges, but we have one, a simple one in our front yard and we got almost three inches of rain in that storm. And as you can see in behind that, that rain gauge, the leaves on the trees, it was a really cool spring. The leaves waited for a really long time to come out. So there really wasn't any leaves on the trees. And we got three inches of rain in about an hour. And what that ended up doing is scouring all the hillsides around our place. Um, so we'd walk around and we'd see like um, the uh, the ramps outside or uh, Virginia wet leaf, anything that was just about getting going, uh, its roots were exposed by how quickly that rain fell. Created this large gully out back, which washed all kinds of sediment into our wetland there. So it was a, a very uh, dramatic storm and and so we were grateful we didn't get a tornado but i was really surprised to see how the landscape re responded to so much rain um so early in the season well even though it wasn't early really i mean 
often the leaves are out by May 12th, but they weren't, they were just getting started. And by the way, this also might happen on the, um, on the November end, and I've seen it happen on that end too, after the leaves have fallen, but it hasn't frozen yet. So that's a sense of climate change and and it's or the changes that we should see um, over the course of the next hundred years. Which I don't know if you're gardening for a hundred years, but uh, maybe maybe forty, maybe forty years or fifty years and into the future. So this is our place. We moved in to this house in uh, 2015. Um, when you move into a new place, when you get a house, you you know. It's maybe stressful, but the landscape is there and you have all kinds of ideas about, you know, how exciting it might be. You can garden, you can grow your vegetables. Maybe you'll have a lawn. You're going to play soccer outside. Whatever it's going to be, a house sort of stimulates all these landscape ideas, but they occur to some degree in the abstract. So what I want to share with you is a set of ideas that I had and um, how those ideas really failed me and failed my landscape. And then I, I'm going to talk about... Um, another set of ideas that I had simultaneously that actually worked out really well. And I'll show you with you how that went. So I'm a vegetable grower and wow, I have a yard. I live in the woods. So the only sun I have is this front yard patch where there was a little bit of a lawn. Um, so we were growing our vegetables there. So it's a terrible shot, but it's out the window and there's screen and everything there. Um, growing our potatoes, our eggplant, tomatoes, everything was doing pretty well, but we just cut some strips right on the lawn. But what that ended up doing was creating a lot of shade. And what that shade ended up doing is stimulating a lot of creeping Charlie growth. So to the point that the whole yard that was once a grass, not a great grass, and it wasn't a lawn, it wasn't irrigated, but it was grass, um, became 100% creeping Charlie, as you saw in the last picture. Um, so I was like, oh, I have to deal with that. I don't like that. And I don't know what it is about creeping Charlie, but it's just as a texture or something. And that smells cool. I like the flowers, so on. But as a texture, it just doesn't feel like a lawn. So I, I was like, I want to get rid of that. Plus, we have woods, and it really does like the woods and spreads down there. And we didn't want that either. So I spread black plastic. Now, we can talk in the question and answer period about different methods for, for controlling things or, or eliminating or smothering. There are different methods. This was the method that I chose. Um, black plastic, because I had a bunch of uh, black thick mill um, sheeting, right? There's another view. You can see all the creeping Charlie there at the bottom when I, where I ran out of plastic. So that was 2018, I think it said. So in May, 2019, I heard it for about a year, maybe a little bit more. I had some raised beds over here um, and I, I dismantled them and moved them elsewhere and put some of that tattered plastic to finish up the job in that area. Um, and so then I built my little raised bed zone, wood chips and cedar and, and for our vegetables and spread compost out all around and leveled it out and everything. Cause I was, my plan was to install sod for a, a particularly not a lot of square footage. Um, and the reason why I wanted to use sod was because I wanted to make sure that the Creeping Charlie stayed smothered. That rolling out that mat of grass is a, is a good way to ensure it doesn't, you know, sprout from seeds that are the seed bank that's there and so on and so forth. I knew that if I seeded the lawn, I'd be battling weeds. And I wanted one little nice piece of lawn. I never had a lawn before. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. Right. And so there it is. By September 2019, I had rolled out that lawn and it started to take and um, things look good, right? There it is in July 2020 and uh, Annabelle hydrangeas are doing great. And the lawn is doing great. Now, I don't irrigate it. Our soil is clay. It generally stays pretty moist. Um, hand weed it. Not that hard when you start from sod, if, as long as you're on top of it. That's what I was doing because, you know, eventually weeds do crop up. Um, no chemicals, no fertilizer, so on and so forth. That's where I was at, and I was pretty, pretty happy with it. Right. And so by September 2020, there's there's the whole deal. It's just sort of this vegetable thing surrounded by um, about around grass. But what I did not take into consideration was rainfall. 
when we moved here uh, in late 2014, or early 2015, we moved in after at least a year or two of good rains and then moved into another five years of higher than average or at least average rains. And so that changed the environment in a way that I had, you know, I was not prepared for. I wasn't even thinking about it. I mean, I knew it was wet, but I was more worried about how I was washing out the driveway or, you know, how the gutters were overflowing in every one of these storms than, than I was thinking about my planting choices, right? I just wanted a lawn. And again, it's important to remember that thunderstorm precipitation accounts for roughly half of that annual total. And there I had, I, so important, I, I made sure it was there in there twice. So, you know, May 2018, one of those three inch thunderstorm rains. And I recorded several of these over the years that we were there, especially those years where it was four inch, 40 inches or more. Um, and that's just one storm. You get a suite of storms over uh, two days. It could be five inches. We've seen definitely seen that. With that rain came all kinds of um, creatures, right? So we had tons of insects, tons. We have wetlands all around us. We had tons of dragonflies, love them. Uh, scarlet tanager that takes residence was happy as could be in our oak trees, catching lots of bugs. I think this one has a bug in his mouth. Uh, of course, tons of frogs, plenty of snakes, even uh, blue spotted salamanders. I was finding them left and right they were everywhere because it was so wet. Even voles, lots of voles and, and plenty of happy owls and, and for that matter, coyotes and, and other creatures to eat the voles. Even the Monarda de Dama, um, which I love, it's a, one of my favorite scents in the world is those leaves crushed. And um, they were happy as can be. This is an Eastern native, right? An Eastern deciduous forest native in Minnesota in the Twin Cities. We're in the far western reaches of that eastern deciduous forest, but we're pretty close to the prairie and our rainfall is really different. This is not native here because it is shallow rooted and it likes moisture and it was getting plenty. So it was doing great. Snapping turtles. Never even th considered that where I cleared the Creeping Charlie with plastic and then removed it and then it rained and it was warm that the snapping turtles that lived in the wetlands around would climb up the hill and lay their eggs where uh, my future lawn would be, right? Of course, there they are. Um, there's one of them. Dozens and dozens of them would hatch over a period of maybe 36 hours. And of course, they would climb downhill because we're at the top and down the driveway. And I'd have to go out there and look for them and move them off the driveway and get them where they were going or else we'd drive over them or the mailman would drive over them. Um, you do see that the lawn is there in the back. So that that clutch that came uh, in in 2019, I left the patch where uh, the um, the eggs were laid, and I covered it with uh, planks of wood because I didn't want raccoons to get them. And I just left that bare, let all the eggs hatch, and then in in like October, I I planted the um, remainder of the grass in that little little square. And from that point forward, I left a bare spot elsewhere in um, the garden for, for the turtle. Another thing from our, our um, vegetable containers that were in this particular area, uh, we had lots of volunteer tomatoes growing up but that I just left because I was didn't care. I was going to be smothering this whole area anyway. But with those tomatoes, and by the way, this is the planks that are over the eggs, this wood that you see underneath this tomato hornworm. Um, with those spare tomatoes, we got tomato hornworms. And, uh, you know, most people aren't, there's different species of them, but most people are not uh, friendly towards them because, you know, they eat tomatoes. But they are the caterpillar of the sphinx moth and we all love the white line sphinx moth and there's different species of those this one white line um because they fly like hummingbirds but they're moths and they're out in the day and uh, they're great to photograph and great to follow around and we were getting tons of those in this time period so these are all sort of environmental things that i wasn't thinking about at all i was noticing but my choices were separate from these observations and then I did not anticipate our above average rains 
and I, 2020 counts as one of those years, down to well below average rains. And so between 2021, which was a drought for us, it certainly felt like a drought. I mean, this rain gauge is about uh, three miles to our south where this official gauge. So it's, I think we had less rain than that, um, but whatever, it, it approximates it. Um, so far this year, we're above average. So there's, there's that. Um, I didn't anticipate how dry things could get because I just spent the last five years being exceptionally wet, right? So normal annual precipitation in Minnesota, you know, it's drier as you go to the West as you obviously you're going towards the Great Plains. And then as you move towards the deciduous forest, it gets a lot wetter and Hennepin County being where it is, it's between 28 and 30 inches, 30 inches is about your average. Um, we're pretty close to 30 to 32. Sometimes we get a little bit more. It's common. But look at this graph here. The annual precipitation, right, 28 to 30 inches, minus evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is all the moisture that evaporates from the ground, evaporates from surfaces of, uh, you know, um, bodies of water, and transpirates through all the grass and the leaves of the trees and all that corn that gets planted and everything else, right? And so that's all the moisture that gets released to the atmosphere. And you see in this graph that we're in the yellow spot. And in the yellow spot, we are at a deficit of minus two inches. That's in a normal, in a normal given year. So it's about as much as goes in, more of it actually comes out. And of course, that has some variability due to clouds and so on and so forth, but that's just the sort of the general average there. And so why does that matter? And it, it matters more when we really get a lot less rain, like in 2022. So this is the number 15th um, uh, map of our drought at that date. And you'll notice that the metro region, region Hennepin County, it, the half of Hennepin County and sliding diagonally to the Southwest is this very same zone that's in a deficit. So our deficit, when we don't get rain, pushes us way farther into drought than say uh, just a few counties to the North or possibly to the Southeast, right? And so th that natural deficit that we have um, exacerbates drought conditions in our, in our county. And if you have um, really well-drained soils, like so I have clay, right? So clay is gonna hold on to the moisture for a, a longer amount of time. Um, if you have sandy soils, like you might from anywhere from the Anoka Sand Plain, which is, you know, Anoka County and further north towards St. Cloud, but also travels down the uh, east side of the Mississippi River through Minneapolis, so you might have sandy soil if you live in some of those regions, that um, deficit is gonna be even more exacerbated. So there's my wonderful lawn in July, 2020. And there's my wonderful lawn in September, 2022. And, um, you know, in 2021, when we were experiencing some drought that got alleviated somewhat by a lot of rain in September. So we didn't really think too much about it in the way we did of 2022, which kept going well into November. Um, people on the radio would be saying, hey, you know, yes, your, your lawn is dormant. It's okay, it'll, it'll recover. And to some degree that is true. And to some degree that's um, not really what lawns are about, right? So if your lawn goes dormant and it rebounds, great, because it rained in that same year, say, right? That's good. But if your lawn is, is in this state for so long that weed seeds and these kinds of things start to be able to take hold, or in this case, because it's actually, it really is dying in that second year, and the weeds really start taking hold. You can see those weeds are green as could be. They could care less that it's never rained. They're really successful in that sort of environment. You know, they sprout when it's hot, they do well in the dry, and when we see that many weeds in a lawn, we generally, at least I do, I think, okay, this isn't a lawn anymore. This is a weed situation. And even if the grass did come back, it wouldn't come back vigorously. It would not be able to outcompete weeds and it would be a losing battle over time, right? So there's a close up you see that they got all kinds of hawk beard and, and medic and 
clovers of various kinds, all kinds of weeds, not really any live grass in there whatsoever. And um, I'm not anticipating it to come back in any real way this, um, this spring. So that's what happens when it's suddenly a drop. That big idea of that wonderful green lawn, which by the way, I spent a good amount of money on that sod and getting it to the house, and not to mention the labor of rolling it out, complete failure. And so I have to make a different choice. And I don't know what that choice is yet, but um, it's not gonna be grass, at least not that grass. So I like this uh, graph, it's a little silly in a way, but it's kind of perfect, really. It's, it's what it is for any catastrophe scenario, right? Like when everything's good, everything's good, and you really don't care. Um, in this case, the um, hydrological uh, cycle, um, you know, when drought comes, you start noticing, and then you become aware of it. Then you become concerned as it starts getting worse, as the lake starts going down much, much lower that you can't get in your boat, right? And then you start panicking because it's October and the leaves just fall off the trees after they were brilliantly red. They just shrivel up and fall off the next day. You're freaking out because what if this continues? What if this turns into a dust bowl? Well, whatever, you know, whatever the freak out becomes. And then it rains again. Or in our case, you know, I was listening to a talk on pollinators or something online, and the host said, geez, I hope the drought doesn't come back next year as if it was gone, right? We, we might have a lot of snow, but we don't have a lot of moisture, and it's all sitting on top of the soil until, you know, the freeze melts. But the point is, when we start seeing snow, we start forgetting about drought. And if it rains, we forget about drought, right? Um, so that's something that we have to disrupt. Here's another graphic that I, I like. So the less resilient and the more resilient. So business as usual. So what is business as usual in a, as a garden? Let's just say it's a whole bunch of plants that require you to water them. Maybe it's a lawn that requires irrigation. And then the acute hazard comes along and maybe that's a drought, right? And then it gets so bad, like it did this year, that say that lawn hits a tipping point. And then you respond and you go out there and you're watering with your with your hose because you don't have irrigation. I saw a lot of that driving around last year, people watering their front lawns. Um, what ends up happening is you get a permanent loss. Or in like in my case, even if I was able to re, uh, resuscitate that lawn, I'd have lots of weeds in it. I would consider that a loss, enough loss that I say, you know what, I'm changing things. I'm not doing it that way. So resilient, something more resilient would be putting in investments to build in that resilience. Now, someone might say, I love my lawn, and so I'm investing in irrigation. And then that acute hazard comes, that drought comes, and you're running that irrigation just like you were you know, before the drought, except that, that drought keeps going when you make a choice like irrigation. And then maybe the city might say, after that acute hazard, the response might be, uh, you have to turn off your water if there is no recovery, right? And then then you have the same problem as if it was business as usual. So for me, I'm going to make a different choice. I'm going to make a different investment. I'm not going to put another bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass lawn in. At minimum, I'm going to look for a drought tolerant grass. Um, maybe I'm going to do better than that. Maybe I'm going to make a completely different choice. Um, and, and that's dependent on all kinds of uh, different things. And I'll talk about some of those things a little bit later. But the point is, if you make an investment, that actually builds in true resilience. Um, your response and recovery is much more effective, and you can get back to that original state, unlike um, the graph on the left, where you don't make any investment. In December of 2015, uh, we built a studio. My wife's an artist. She's a sculptor, Betsy Allen, and she needed a studio, and we had the resources to do it when we first moved in, and and so we built that, and around that I had options. I could plant grass, much like I was planting on the front front yard, but we were starting from scratch. The soil here is sub sub. Uh, you know, subsoil, it's heavy clay, no organic matter, smelled like sulfur. Um, so maybe it had some organic matter in it. Uh, and class five gravel, which is what you used, you know, underneath driveways, four driveways, four dirt roads, or gravel roads, 
um, underneath concrete. And it was highly compacted because I was driving machinery around that all, you know, for what appeared to be like a year. So I had to make a decision about how I was going to plant that. So this is July 2017. So a year later, you can see the weeds are starting to come in. I seeded some fescue, uh, you know, shade mix over here because, you know, the, the back of this area is mostly shade, front is mostly sun. Uh, we had a big basswood tree on the, on the left there, multi-trunk, creating most of that shade and some maples in the back. And so this is morning sun, and then it gets afternoon shade in like three o'clock or two o'clock forward, depending on the time of the year. Um, and so given all the rains that we were having, I really wasn't a fan of gutters. All I did was watch them overflow and the water run down the house side and make big puddles outside the house anyway. So the first thing that I chose to do was not install gutters, even though the building guy insisted I should. And I made what I call ground gutter, which is essentially a pipe in the ground that's in a trench that captures the water that flows off the roof. The key there is you have to consider the, the arc of the water under a really heavy event. And so you make sure that the pipe is past the point of where that rain will splash down. Right. So what ends up happening, you got plastic in there. That's your sort of barrier to catch the water. There's landscape fabric in there. Um, and then it's filled with the crushed, you know, the big stone, uh, three quarter inch or whatever, inch and a half stone. So the water flies off the roof. It, it hits those rocks, kind of bounces around, it collects in a pipe, and then it goes off into a, uh, what a, like a dry well that's out in the back and, and puts the water in the, into the ground. Um, around the whole building, I put down um, a, a straw because I, I knew, you know, the weeds were going to come. And this is September. I suspect that I winter seeded this uh, with a savanna mix from Prairie Moon. Um, I, I'm, I'm, and I know I did. I don't think I put any actual live plants in there, just just seed. I just don't remember if I did it in December or if I did it in, in February or something like that. So by June 21st, 2019, so this is, right, if I seeded in, uh, let's say, December 2017, now we're in June. So we're a year and a half from that seeding. This is what's growing. No live plants. I'm getting some, some good growth out of that seed. Um, and of course, you get a prairie mood scene mix. It's not always going to be perfectly 100% Hennepin County native, right? They don't break them down by the by the counties. So if that's something you care about, you probably don't want to spread those mixes without checking the the packet or the contents of that seed mix. So we got a lot of um, some uh, hairy beard tongue in there, which is a great garden plant, by the way. Uh, but it isn't native to here. It's native to our south and uh, you know Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, so on and so forth. But it really is a great, great plant. Um, but anyway, things are doing pretty well. By July 30th, so, you know, five weeks later, wow, I got Liatris blooming. Um, there's Hori Vervain. The little blue stem is really growing quite a bit. There's some butterfly weed. So things are doing pretty well. By September, I'm not as happy. Right. So this is the second year, right, after I, I seeded. Um, I think the little blue stem is looking kind of wily. Uh, there's Canada goldenrod that decided to show up in the up or around the back there. And if you know Canada goldenrod, it's kind of a problem. Native species, great, love goldenrod flowers, love the pollinators that love them. Um, but it's it's a really strong grower, and uh, it's too strong for this particular plot. So I spent some time weeding that out. Um, I also want to on the right, bottom right, there's bluegrass sod. You know, I had a leftover from my sod work in the front, so a little 10 by 10 patch there, and everything else is seeded fescue. That will matter later, so that's why I point that out, that it's those two things right in the same space. Um, so September 2020, still see that Canada golden rod back there. Um, so I still didn't get rid of it by 2020. Um, I did work on it in 21 and, and this year, and it's pretty much all gone now. It's possible. You see the Liatris aspera, the rough um, blazing star here on the right and lots of other things. But I'm still not really that terribly happy with it at this point. But by August 2021, I'm really starting to like it a lot more. Um, 
some species take some time to really, uh, and I think this is one of the big things that people have with the problems people have with prairie gardens that, that those first three years, it's like, ah, I don't really like it that much. Not that nice. Um, but there's some key things that I'm doing here is I'm moving things around, um, weeding out native species that I, I don't, um, I don't want, they're going to be too big. Uh, maybe they're self seeding a lot like the asters. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of sort of, uh, you know, editing in there. And I'm also plunking in some things that I started by seed in a pot. Um, you'll notice here, these reds, often people who don't know native plants that well say, oh, look at that cardinal flower growing in your prairie, which anybody who knows that, well, the cardinal flower is kind of a wetland plant. What's it doing in your dry prairie? Um, so that's Silene regia. It's not native. Again, like uh, it's similar in an environment to the prairie. Uh, beer tongue, right? So Illinois, it's big in Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin. It doesn't spread terribly, really. It self-seeds around slowly, pops up here and there. I'm perfectly happy growing it. I'm not really worried about it. Um, and there's nothing else like it in a prairie garden. That red, that scarlet red is very different from the cool blue red of, of a cardinal flower, which of course wouldn't make it in this in this particular garden. I had a lot of asters in 2021. Um, they were just everywhere, lots of blue wood aster, um, all just many different kinds, panicled aster. And so I spent a lot of time weeding out asters now. And I try to do that mostly in the spring when they're these little guys and there's just tons of little seeds. I mean, you can imagine all these flowers, pollinators are going crazy in this. I mean, it's just buzz noise in September, October. But all those flowers, all that pollination, I get tons of seeds and, and it could pretty much take over the whole thing. Now remember this space too is shade, is pretty much full shade, shade to full sun. And so I'm colliding two spaces, you know, and this should be this mergy sort of overlap space. That as a concept is really nice, but it doesn't really work out that well in practice. Don't always show winter shots. So I thought I would show this December, December shot. I do not cut things down uh, in winter. There's really no point when the snow slides off that roof, it knocks it all down for me anyway. By spring 2022, I got my early metal rue here in the shade spot. Uh, I got I got my Jacob's ladder going. Um, it's doing really well. The woodland flocks surprisingly doing well on the prairie side of of this this planting. <clears throat> you see it in front of the columbine, which is also doing too well in the prairie part of the planting to the point that it was actually smothering some of the prairie plants with its giant growth of leaves. Um, questionable why that's ha happening there. I mean, this is a slope. It's class five gravel primarily to dig down. It's just like, ooh, that's your soil. It's terrible soil. Um, but uh, Columbine is remarkably drought tolerant. Here you can see a whole lot of it and all the seed heads to the point that I, have, I cut the seed heads off because I don't want it to take over this this area totally. So this is June, probably early June. You see the prairie flocks is starting to go there. Um, that hairy beard tongue is a um, is a sort of a May bloomer. It usually starts in May. It's a great early bumblebee plant. Then by mid June, prairie flocks is doing its thing. The hairy beard tongue is winding back. By late June, we got our butterfly weed going like crazy. Uh, the narrow leaf cone or the prairie flocks is doing great. Um, there's another shot. It's got the um, uh, prairie clover in there. I love prairie clover. It fills in nicely, just pops up here and there. Pollinators love it. There's another shot. You can see my little blue stem. The little blue stems are, I have a particular patch of very blue gray little blue stem. And I, I really, I, I like those. I, and to some degree, I, I favor them in the, in the, in the garden because they do self-seed there too. And, and there's opportunity for, for editing them out. Also see in the upper right, there's the silene regia and then the purple in the back middle looks like it's prairie clover. Yeah. And I almost confused it for the hoary vervain, which happens in July, great July flowering plant. Um, again, pollinators love it with the uh, prairie onions. Um, you can still see some orange butterfly weed. So this slide, remember back to the one where I pointed out the um, bluegrass sod and the and the 
uh, fescue that I seeded. So this is July 2022. We hadn't had rain in about two months. Um, the sod is is dead. Any green you see there is actually chunks of uh, clumps of of the fescue that you know was the, popped up or just pushed through the dead sod. Um, so worth noting that that um, the fescues are are much more tolerant of drought conditions than any bluegrass sod you could ever have. But also notice how green and lush the prairie is, even though it hasn't rained in two months. The only difference I would say at this point was things were a little shorter than they were the year before. It's also worth pointing out that yes, we have deer and I omitted these slides because time, but deer do come and prune a whole bunch of things when they're young and tender growth. And the great thing is that they never nibble it down to the ground. And, and then usually what happens is things like the prairie flocks come back bushier than ever. Um, same with the colony, you know, they nibble on the columbines. Um, even sometimes the liatris, but never so far down. The liatris blooms so late that it doesn't get that, um, doesn't nip off the bud. That's the bluegrass sod. So there's a liatris aspera. Could care less about the drought we we're having. Um, I have a lot of uh, asters, potentially short aster that was in the seed mix. The blue stem aster. I'm sorry, the blue stem uh, goldenrod, which is a great goldenrod, but it does self seed prolific prolifically, um, so I spend time thinning that out. It looks great in, in um, September and into October, and the pollinators are just going crazy with it. Um, but it is a self-seed spreader, um, so I'm a less happy about it than I am, say, uh, like the Silene Regia or the um, hairy uh, beard tongue. And of course, October, the seeds of the Leatris aspera. So, um, Important to say, sorry, I got to slide some things around so I can see my heading there. About resiliency, um, dry prairie species, if you plant them in the proper conditions, are going to be way more tolerant of excessive rainfall than any moisture demanding species are going to be tolerant of drought, right? So that's fairly clear. If you have a water loving plant and it's a drought, that plant is most likely going to die unless it has an incredible root system that it can store energy in and then come back next year. Um, whereas the dry prairie species either are fine or if they are knocked back, have a lot of energy in their really deep, uh, big roots because they spend a lot of time growing their roots. I'm growing prairie turnip now. I'm watching these things. I just plucked one out. You know, they spend a lot of time growing those roots. And then that root is a storehouse of energy. So if they have a bad year, or they come and get nipped by an animal or, or whatever, they have energy to come back the next year. So anyway, that's the point. Prairie species are much more tolerant of excessive rainfall. Will they be able to handle a flood? Can you grow them in a basin with water? I don't think so. But in general conditions that are right, they do great. Um, they also stand up to drying winds much better without flopping over, but just not desiccating so quickly. Of course, the deep roots that I mentioned that aids percolation, so that allows water to go seep into the soil instead of run off of it. It's much more tolerant of high heat. So, you know, if 95 degree is a high heat day and you start seeing wilty leaves, not going to be a problem for those dry prairie plants. In fact, over 100, not going to be a problem. And from a cultural point of view, those short dry prairie plants are probably the most valuable for next to sidewalks and street medians where pavement, heat, compaction, drought, car doors, possibly salt, just depends on the species. Mm -hmm. And people are concerned. You know, one of the, some of the worst native plantings in, in, you know, they call them the hill strips and so on, are the tall species. I'm like, oh, that's a disaster. Nobody likes that really. Um, and I just think that those are potentially somebody didn't, you know, just sort of see the future of where that would be. There's plenty of short, dry prairie plants that are perfect for those spaces. And of course, anybody who steps on a plant repeatedly is going to kill it. So it's not going to stand up to that. My recommendation is always if you to observe and see where the car doors are opening and then put, you know, rocks or a paver or something down where those car doors are always opening. Don't plant things there. It won't make it. Um, and of course, dry prairie plants have the added benefit of providing for the birds, the pollinators, and of course, the colorful flowers for people because we love our flowers. Um, so dry prairie plants are really the most resilient 
plants for Minnesota yards, um, given that we are on the edge of the prairie, um, given that we could get excessive moisture, but that we could also get um, a really long-term drought. It's possible. And it only takes a, a year of really bad drought of several months without water to do plants in, without excessive watering on your own. It's also important to note that um, landscapes full with not full of non-native plants um, have much less of the prey of birds, caterpillar, spiders, much less. So the more native plants you have, the much more of those species you have, and the much happier the birds are. Right. And so science is study this. Uh, your young fledgling goes down, the rate goes down considerably in a non-native uh, plant landscape. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of what that might look like if, if you're unsure what those non-native plant landscapes might look like in a few slides. Um, where to plant a prairie, right? Full sunlight. You can plant a prairie here in the Twin Cities area. Um, dry prairies, most important thing is good drainage. And and if you're unsure, what I like to tell people is bring me a little baggie of your soil where you're planting. Just put it in a bag and bring it to the nursery and we'll be able to decide if it, you have good drainage. Another way is to dig a hole, pour water in it and see how long it takes to drain. And you can just Google that, that test and it'll tell you, you know, is it good drainage if it drains in a minute and it's bad drainage if it takes all day, that kind of stuff. Um, but generally we know if it's sandy or really loose or probably, and even if it's clay, if it's sloped, that counts as good drainage. Um, of course, you want to select the correct species for dry prairie. Um, I planted a liatris, uh, uh, or maybe it was a spicata, in, in not knowing what I was buying. I, I bought this liatris, and I planted it right in my dry prairie. And it was raining so much, I was like, wow, look at this. I think it was even one on the slides. Look at how great this is doing. And then in 2021, 20, uh, it disappeared. And we had this drought, you know, minor drought at our place. Um, and then this last year, it, you know, it's just, it was just gone. Meanwhile, the Leatris Aspera that I had planted just got better every year. Didn't care that it was raining. Um, and it didn't care that it wasn't raining. So you want to make sure you pick the right one. And, and so, and this is accounts across many species. There's a, a Leatris for every soil condition. This, this is four, there's tons of them. So you just want to make sure you Pick the right one. Don't just go on Blazing Star, say. You know, the problem with Pycnostachia is it's prairie Blazing Star. And people hear prairie and they think dry. That's why I, I'm specific, say dry prairie, because there's plenty of wet prairie. And we don't want wet prairie. We generally don't have wet prairie uh, yards because we don't want water near our house for all kinds of reasons, right? So uh, make sure you pick the right one. If you're just going in your average garden soil or say your irrigator or whatever, Atrus ligostylus is a great one. It's, it's the kind of one that can take a little dry, can take a little wet. It's right there in the middle. Aspera for, for your general dry. And if you really have sandy, blazing hot, go with punctata. It's much shorter, but it can really tolerate very low moisture and super well-drained. Um, so there's a lot of neighborhoods around here like this. Uh, and this is what they look like, you know, the landscaper came in, blah, 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 plunked. I mean, I hardly doubt that the homeowners are responsible for most of these, these choices here. Um, it's just sort of how the house came, right? Same here with the, the row of arbaviti, because I don't want to see the fence or I don't want to see the neighbors, but you're not going to see the neighbors because you're never outside because I live in the suburbs and I never see my neighbors outside on their grass ever. Uh, you know, maybe if there's kids, I've done a lot of gardening around these lakes, uh, over the last five years, and I hardly ever see a human being. Another great spot for a prairie. Um, you know, I mean, there's a zen quality to this, right? Just for a minute after the horse gets mulched. Um, but it's not providing a lot of habitat for birds or, or anything, really. Prairie. So what happens if I live in the woods? Right? A lot of my neighbors live in the woods. A lot of my neighbors didn't get a house put on a farm, you know, where the trees were already cleared. They still live in the woods. Um, you know, we're in the, the province of the deciduous forest. Most of our area is deciduous woods. We do have prairies, but as I mentioned, some of those are wet. A lot of those are wet, um, and we don't generally build houses on wet prairie. 
Um, so how do we deal with that? We can't necessarily plant a dry prairie in, in the woods because we don't have enough, enough sun or the trees are always encroaching. Um, my recommendation for that is uh, to go with a woodland edge or clearing or savanna type planting. Um, most of our woodland yards have trees that bound the side or we have trees in them or maybe even street trees that are really big uh, and they kind of mimic the woodland edge clearings of savanna. That woodland edge is an incredibly biodynamic space. Um, there's all kinds of creatures in those spaces. So it's a, it's a, if you're interested in wildlife, woodland edge is a great place to be, uh, an environment to be growing plants in. Um, of course, the light is typically part sun, part shade, tends to be upland soils because we tend to not build in the lowlands. Um, and upland soils tend towards what we call mesic, which is just your basic medium soil. Of course, medium soil becomes dry soil if it never rains, but in general, when it rains, normally it's around what we call medium. Um, of course, there's a lot of shrubs in those spaces, and shrubs are super high value to wildlife for berries, to be for perches, for nesting, all kinds of reasons. And for what it's worth, um, the uh, Minnesota DNR recommends these tree species to plant if you want to plant trees. Um, I'm a little unsure about the American elm, given the Dutch elm disease and all that other stuff. Um, but uh, some of these others are obviously are good choices. Um, I, I plan on on selling some uh, different tree species like ironwood. I love ironwood. Um, it grows here in our in our woods, uh, but not too many. I don't sell too many tree species. But there's some other nurseries around that do like out back. They sell a lot of trees. So uh, some additional thoughts. I'm checking my time. Okay, I think we're okay. Observe your property under varying conditions and seasons. That's really important. That's not what I did when I decided to plant that lawn. Other than, is it sunny? I mean, I knew it was sunniest there. Um, of course, these are the common questions. Is it full sun, part sun, shade? Are there a lot of trees? A little. What's my soil like? Is it wet? Is it medium? Is it dry? Most of us aren't going to have really wet soil, but you might have a spot on your property that does have wet soil. And if you have a water management issue um, where you're getting like a runoff or something and you do have that wet zone and it's not impacting your house, meaning like water running down the inside of your basement walls, uh, you might consider a rain garden in that spot. You have a good setup uh, for something instead of trying to grow grass in it that keeps dying because of, you know too much water is collecting. It'd be a great place for some... Uh, carbon flower amongst many other species. You know, is your soil sandy? Is it clay? Is it organic? You know, if it's sandy and it collects water, it still might be well drained enough that it's not considered particularly moist. Um, back to that excessive runoff. Um, a lot of people around here, because it's uh, we have moraines, you know, glacial moraines, these sort of slopey up and down spaces. Um, the houses are built on slopes. Often they have decks on these giant, you know, columns where the yard slopes down in the back. Um, you wanna use plants to slow that water. You don't want erosion. Erosion is one of the worst things. That, that basically means nothing good is happening in your, in your yard space when you have erosion. Um, so use plants to slow that water and aid soil percolation. You wanna get the soil, water into the soil. The more water you get in the soil, by the way, the less evapotranspiration there is. Um, you want, if you have gullies forming, uh, you know, because of runoff, you can slow it down with rocks and plants. You can mix your rocks and plants. You know, anything that the water impacts will slow it down. Um, of course, you can capture that excessive runoff with a rain garden and have like a really nice rain garden. Of course, restrict your lawn size to necessity and for specific purposes. So consider lawn grass for only pathways for sitting areas or whatever it else it is that you might need a lawn for. By all means, if you have the option, eliminate bluegrass because it is water hungry. It is a cool season grass. It hates hot weather. You have to water it immensely in hot weather. It, whether if it gets um, extra hot and you are watering, it still might brown. Um, it's a cool season grass. By the way, our prairie grasses, there are some cool season, but primarily they're warm season grasses, which is why they tend to not start pushing up until the middle of June. Um, if you are going to plant grass, I recommend fescue mixes. There's all kinds for parts shade, drought tolerance, full sun. It's a much finer grass. It's not that dense carpet that, you know, people want and rub their toes in after they mow it. Uh, it's a different kind of grass, but it is green. And I have to say the fescue that I seeded out there, yes, it's in part shade, um, but it stayed green the whole season and I never watered it. 
So it's much hardier in terms of uh, water tolerance and can take a certain amount of shade. Design is one of the big questions I get. Um, you know, I, I know all the plants, I know the plants I want, but I don't know what I'm going to do for a design. And so the industry has kind of, you know, got into a huddle and figured something out. And so you'll see this matrix planting scheme left and right on the internet or in webinars and so on and so forth. And so if you don't know what that is, it's really basic. The matrix is a grid, you know, and architects love to use a grid to begin their design process. Um, it's, it's very similar, you know, it's just a grid. In fact, I'm looking at a grid right now on a cutting board that's got the grid. So each square has got a corner, each corner has a plant in it, right? So if you're doing a yard or you're doing a thousand square feet, you're gonna lay out a grid of uh, one foot squares on that. And you're gonna drop a blue gramma, a prairie drop seed or side oats gramma on every corner, right? And that's your grid. And that's sort of your base species. And if it's shade, maybe you're gonna use sedges and rushes um, instead of those uh, sunny loving uh, prairie grasses, right? And then it's care, different carex species. And there's more species than this. These are just some examples. Um, and you're going to want to use trays of plugs for that. You're not going to want to seed because the weeds are going to take over before that ever happens, right? You want to start with plants. The great thing about the grasses and the sedges is animals tend to not bother with them. I, I can't really speak for rabbits, but I know deer, um, but it, rabbits probably aren't. Someone else can, probably has this experience. I know there's, you know, Minneapolis is the rabbit city. Uh, and, um, they generally tolerate, you know, they, they don't eat them. Um, so you put those little plugs in there and they're much more cost efficient. Uh, you can get dozens of them, um, you know, for, you know, it's a range of prices, but whatever. Trust me that it's a lot cheaper than buying four inch pots, eight inch pots, gallon pots for those things. Anyway, that's your base carpet. And then there's spaces in between each one of those plants. And in those spaces, that's where you put your forbs, your herbaceous plants, your flowering species, right? And you might want to group those for design principles and not just have one here, one there, right? So you want to have little clusters, a mass, and this helps it look more attractive. This is more aesthetic. This is a human principle, you know, like groups of three, groups of fives, odd numbers are good. You know, nature doesn't care about that, but we do. And so do that and your neighbors might be less upset with you for ditching the lawn for for a wild looking uh, prairie yard. Uh, keep your species under three feet tall. You know, we've all seen that native plant yard in the city that has these eight foot things and they're leaning over. It's just, again, the social contract says, maybe we should keep it shorter. Um, if you do have taller species, put them in the back, put them in the center of, of a bed. Um, you can use plugs or potted plants for those flowering species. Uh, you know, it's, you're just going to be buying less of those than of the grasses or the sedges. So you can, you know, put your budget, you, you know, uh, use your budget differently for the flowering species. And you don't have to put them all in in the same year, right? You're getting that matrix down, you're letting that start growing. And then over time, you're filling in and you're editing and you're moving things around as, as you like. You certainly are, can be gardening this space. You know, it's not a conservation easement. And of course, special topic for me because I do sell ephemerals. I do grow ephemerals. I have a hash of ephemerals that I inherited from my, my father-in-law who sold them and my mother-in-law who sold them. And when their property went under the plow or the bulldozer, right? I have those. They're, you know, they're very hard to propagate. Um, and they have to be propagated by division. Seeds just take forever. There are a few that can be grown from seed fairly successfully, but I always get people asking me for ephemerals and I'm kind of, you know, uh, hard, uh, hard on that because I, there, we have few of them and I hate giving them away just to know that they're not going to make it. If, if you haven't planted sedges, you shouldn't be planting ephemerals, right? Like don't plunk Dutchman's breeches down um, just because you like it. Right. It's it's like the icing on the cake. It really is something a little bit extra. Save that. Have success with the easier plants first and then bring in those harder plants and see if you can establish them. If you can establish them in a in a suburban yard or a city lot, more power to you. Um, but I restrict how many I sell to any individual. 
Um, and I ask a lot of questions before I, I let them go. There are some that are easier and I'm much more uh, free with them. Um, uh, Virginia beauty, the Claytonia species, uh, bellwort is a little bit a little bit better. So anyway, there's a few anemone. Um, uh, Rue anem anem anemone is a, is a good one. That's actually amazingly hardy for an ephemeral. In fact, it was green all, all year last year, even though it was a drought. And it flowered again in the fall. Okay, so I'm running out of time here, but I'm almost there. My value proposition. It's not so much about your regular flower garden, your perennial garden, but bluegrass versus short grass prairie, because really that's that's really the 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 lawn is more of a problem area than someone's perennial garden. So, pros of the bluegrass bluegrass lawn mastery. I get on my mower and I mow it, and it's done, and I got it right. Like there's a lot of that in keeping lawns. Familiarity, it's always been there. Security, and that means multiple things, right? It means I see order when I look out and see everybody's crop lawn. It's like the, it's like a bunch of guys with a crew cut. I'm not worried about them. I'm going to be okay. People see security when they see lawns. Um, also, maybe I maybe sight. You know, people talk about that, the Savannah hypothesis, and all that. I don't buy into that as much as some people. Um, of course, recreational potential. You can barbecue on it. You can go play soccer on it, and so on. You can even have your dog poop on it and pick it up great for that um, but then of course something much more difficult the symbolic currency how important is it what does it represent to our culture and that's uh, something that's a lot harder to change um, cons of course if it wasn't installed already when you bought the house and you're going to install it that's got a pretty big cost irrigation investment your water bill of course maintenance time and money um, you know it doesn't support really any additional life, except for maybe grubs, right? Which are pouring the chemicals down on it. But I suspect you're all converted on that already. Um, environment hazards, of course, all the chemicals, the nitrogen, it all runs off. And of course, your lawnmower carbon footprint. Those are the pros and cons. They're, maybe they're fairly equal in number. But for the short grass prairie, the pros are much greater. I mean, first of all, I think it looks a lot more lovely. Uh, there's no fertilizer, no water, no chemicals, uh, no watering once established, and that probably happens the first, few, uh, you know, three to three to five months when you put your plugs in. Um, little maintenance, maybe no maintenance, a little bit of management possibly. Uh, you know, and management means things like pulling out the random dandelion that props up in the middle of the little blue stem. That happens. Um, supports all that insect life feeds birds, other wildlife, of course, the flood management potential um, that we talked about earlier, of course, drought tolerant, talked about that early, very little pestilence, maybe no pestilence, you know, I mean, you're not going to get uh, Japanese beetle grubs in there, they're supported by the lawn over the winter, and in the spring months, they come out of lawns. Um, of course, botanical surprises, which is one of my favorite reasons for growing things this way, is every year it's different. Every year it's a little different. I'm not expecting to see the peony in the same spot and I'm waiting for it and there it is. Every year, things are gonna be a little bit different. Cons, initial investment, time and money, but maybe more importantly to people, knowledge acquisition. You know, that time investment, it's not a matter of mastery. I mean, it's not a matter of mastery for me. It's always a matter of learning. I don't think that's a con. I think that's a big pro. I like to learn. Not everybody has time for it. Um, there are things that you have to learn. That said, it's okay to make mistakes. I mean, that's what gardening is. It's killing things, making mistakes. Uh, the marginal social acceptance, it's a thing. You know, Maybe it's a little easier here in Minneapolis than it is elsewhere. I, I don't know, but we just had a new neighbor. Guy sold his house. He had a prairie there always. Every year it was lovely. And the people who bought it, the first thing they did, it seemed like before they even put their couch in, they mowed that down and they continue to mow it. Um, so people don't necessarily see it as a good thing. And of course, it's not ideal for soccer. My final thoughts before we get to questions. Um, it's really important to understand that the garden, the garden is a symbolic entity, right? Um, and what I mean by that is that it simplifies complexity. A garden isn't the natural world. It's a simplification. It's also a simplification of our relationship 
with nature. Um, it can be read at a glance. That's why lawns do so well. It's instantaneous. People understand what they're looking at. Um, and of course, that's social currency because it's symbolic. And so that could be a Japanese garden in Japan. Symbolic significance, which you can take a whole you know, college class in. Or uh, Versailles, again, a symbolic landscape. You might not even be conscious of it, but you're reading it as you're through it. Maybe the headquarters, I hate this landscape, but it kind of fits the bill. And definitely the Great American Lawn, one of the most simple, one of the most, in a sense, practical um, symbolic landscapes. And so I'll leave you with this thought or this quote. In the planting of trees and herbs, you make their natural habitats your model. So the landscape garden mirrors nature. And it is said that in each and all, we must return to the two words, natural habitat. And when I read that, I think, oh, is that Aldo Leopold? Is that some, uh, you know, American uh, wilderness uh, prophet who said such a thing? And it's not at all. It's a Japanese garden writer, 15th century, who said it. And I think that's important. Um, and, and it's important because the currency of this is, is long. And I, it's, not an, it's not a new thing. Um, but it's also important, that line, for the landscape garden mirrors nature. And we know about mirrors. You know, it's fun to put the, pick up the cat and put it in front of the mirror and see how it responds to its reflection. We know mirrors aren't the real thing. And we have to know that our landscape gardens, as native as we want to make them, are not the real thing. Because one of the things that I get all the time is worry and concern about making the wrong choices. I hear these questions all the time. And if you have a lawn or you have a conventional uh, you know, perennial garden, one of those beds like I showed in one of those slides earlier, you cannot mess up that native plant garden enough to be as dead as those spaces, at least in terms of life, you know, wildlife. Um, it may feel more like a failure to you in terms of aesthetics, because I get that question a lot too. But in terms of like, can I plant this uh, Russian sage, which is drought tolerant and doesn't spread in my prairie garden? I say, sure, go for it. I plant Silene regia. It is not native to here. I'm not that strict. If you want to be that strict, go for it. Um, I think that we need to relax um, our intensity about this, about doing the right thing. These little things that we do are more right than not doing anything. And, and I think that's a good place to start, that uh, it's just important to know that we're not recreating nature, we're creating a garden, and it's in symbolic, and it's about our relationship to nature and how we think about it and how, how we relate to it. And we're starting we're at this threshold of thinking about our relationship differently because we've kind of gone so far in the other direction to technology and internal and and not spending as much time in nature but anyway i can go on and on so i'm going to cut it off there because i think that is oh there's some sure in springtime all right i stop Great, thank you so much. We're gonna open it up to questions now. So go ahead and um, type your questions in the Q&A box and we will read them out and task Frank, so. And I'm happy to stay. I can stay as long as you need to answer the questions. I like answering questions. Cool. So the first one we have here is, um, do you have any suggestions for some no-mo plants for a shady backyard that, um, that people walk on? What was that word? Nomo? Nomo. Oh, Nomo. <laughs> like, is that an acronym I don't recognize? <laughs> Nomo. What does that mean? Like Soho? Uh, yeah, walk on is tough, just like the car door problem. Um, like I, I walk on our on our uh, sedges, right? Like uh, Carrots, Pennsylvania. I walk on it, but it's just me and it's not that much. And I vary my path. So generally, Plants don't want to be walked on no more than we do. And so in the shade, especially 
tough. I, I would, Juncus tenuous is a rush. Um, it's called path rush and path because it grows alongside paths. It can tolerate a certain amount of compacted soil. So compacted soil is problem one with walking, um, but crushing the crown, which is the brain of the plant, the place where the leaves come out and the roots come out, that crown, if you crush that, you often do a plant in or at least make it uh, struggle. Uh, violas can stand up to a certain amount. They like shade. So what I'm planning to do, I have a shady spot. The soil is super clay, super compacted. Um, after I do some work on that part of the house, I'm planning on making it a sedge viola meadow space. So it's shade or mostly shade because I that can tolerate some walking, but I'm putting pest stones down in the center of it because you know, I just know where I walk, it's going to suffer. It's okay to make paths and try to stay on them. Do we have any other questions coming into the chat here? That's it, huh? Um, please say more about grubs killing lawns in South Minneapolis. Okay, so grubs is sort of a generic term for those ugly white things that you dig up sometimes when you're digging you know, I find this white curled thing and it's like, oh God, it's light. I hate it. Um, Japanese beetles have larvae and we call them grubs. And when you go to the Menards or whatever and you see those giant sacks of chemicals and says, kills grubs, great for your lawn. Grubs are, are basically the larva of beetles and they munch on roots. And they don't necessarily munch on little blue stem roots. They munch on Kentucky bluegrass, which isn't from Kentucky. Um, you know, Eurasian grass species, and and they love that. And so they overwinter in that, and in the fall or in the spring, they're eating those roots, and then they emerge, and then you get say your Japanese beetles, which is the primary grub. But there's other ones. Uh, June beetles are another grub species, um, but they really love the lawn grass and eat their roots, and so chemicals is the way people deal with that but if you get rid of your lawn no grubs i mean they're there but they're they're just not in mass <laughs> you know um what would you suggest for a steep bank that ends at a road it's mostly in the sun but part is under a spruce tree oh a spruce tree a landscape tree very dense shade under that spruce tree, I'm guessing. What would you suggest for a steep bank that ends at the road? See, now specific recommendations are really tough without my eyes on the site. Um, what's the soil like, right? What's the moisture? It's steep bank, so it, all right, it's well-drained probably. What's growing there now? Is there anything there now? Is there a lawn there now? Kind of need more, there's just, it's questions. More questions instead of answers. Uh, so. I don't have a suggestion without having all those details. Feel free to email me, Linda. Send me oh. a picture. So what is your opinion on um, ox-eye daisies? Are they a good pollinator plant? Ox-eye daisies. Uh, common name problem here uh, because there's, there's a common ox-eye, which is more of a, a, a false sunflower. But then there's the white Eurasian species Right, the white daisy that is uh, pretty close to an invasive species if it isn't one. Um, it, it's spreads really big in like uh, like a forage fields. Uh, and there's some fields around here. If this is the one you're talking about, that um, there's a point in the summertime when it is just white as far as the eye can see. And it's those, I mean, they are prolific and hard to get rid of. I have them in my yard. They just showed up probably on shoes and whatnot. And I pull them out and I never can get rid of them all. I mean, they're not the worst in the world. Uh, they tend to populate human spaces more than wild spaces, but I suspect in some places they, they could be an issue. Um, and so if it's near wild environment and it, like if it's really dense shade and acidic and wet, they're probably not gonna do well there. They're kind of more of a meadow species but they'll grow in woodland edges and things. So just keep it in check. Um, so what is kind of the HOA situation with um, native plantings? Are they resistant to it? Is it, I'm assuming it's probably neighborhood specific. Yeah, every HOA is gonna be different. It's got different people on it. HOAs are not things, they're people. 
and people have ideas. And usually these organizations are run by someone with a profoundly strong ideas, maybe just one person. Um, in fact, my first customer last year came and he spent a lot of money. Thank, thank you. Um, and he was working on his HOA. He lives in Edina. He told me, he's like, I've been working on my HOA for two years. And I finally got them to accept my planting plan. And so I, th I think with HOAs, you really got to sell the those pros that I mentioned, good for life, so on. I mean, the, the problem is people see weedy, but what we need is sort of an aesthetic conversion that people don't see dereliction when they see prairie. They have to see, they have to um, think of the High Line in New York or something. You know, they have to think of high high level aesthetics when they see it. And so you need to have a good design. And that matrix idea is a good start because it keeps things very orderly. Yeah, I love it when you see the little signs that are like, I'm not a weed, I'm a rain garden. I see those a lot in places. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some pretty bad rain gardens out there that are a weed, you know, unfortunately. I mean, because that's the thing about the mastery. It's easy to keep up with a lawn, essentially. You have a program, you do it, you can be thoughtless, you can listen to the game and drink a beer. Whereas native plants, you're like, oh, is that thistle? Is that the wrong thistle? Should I pull it out? Oh my God, I waited too long and look at how many there are. You know, it's a different, it's a different beast. It's all about the planning though. Um, okay, so we got a question here. Have you noticed any specific insect declines on your property with the past two drought seasons? Well, absolutely. When the nursery inspector came to my place in 2021, um, he was like, you know, the, one of the first things he said, you know, after spending my time going over your place, you wouldn't think there's a problem with insects based on my experience here dragonflies were everywhere, damselflies. I mean, it was just crazy good insect year. Um, dragonflies almost non-existent last year. Uh, and interestingly, inside my nursery pen was a bonanza of insects. And outside of it, not so much. And I, I think the primary reason was because I was watering it because I had to, to keep them alive. Um, so many spiders, you know, sorry. If you don't like spiders, you might have to, you know, just come at the right time of the year. There's a time when they're a little more active, um, but also all kinds of beetles and like uh, soldier beetles, which I hadn't experienced before, came and took out all the aphids on the swamp milkweeds because they always get aphids, you know? And I was like, wow, look at them all. There's tons of them. So there was a lot of activity where there was water. When the water declines, it seems to be, at least in our um, eastern deciduous realm, insects decline. So in other words, where they're adapted to the dryness of, say, the prairie, that may not be an issue. But when it's extra dry where it's normally wet, so all our wetlands, I mean, my our place is surrounded by wetlands. There's no non-wet place where it's sort of, a, you got to go over this little bridge in a sense to get to us. Um, it was so dry that when I dug down in the wetland, um, near our culvert, I dug down 16 inches and it was granular and like poured through my hands. There was no water. And that has to affect all the species that that are born out of the water, particularly the dragonflies, which I love. And, and they weren't there. So yes, the answer is yes. I have a question. This is Marion. Um, so we are a bird loving organization and um, you talked about planting for height and planting for different soils and sun. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, maybe how to calibrate bloom times and spacing for both aesthetic reasons, but also like all those plants that are gonna make food for birds at different times of year. And if you're trying to entice different species, how would you, um, maybe create a proportion of like how much of your yard is blooming at any given time. Hmm. Yeah. And, and that's, that's tricky. So let's make an assumption that your yard is all sun, right. Or mostly sun, right. Because if it's shade, that's going to throw a wrench into things. Um, birds aren't always eating seeds, right. They're eating a lot of insects, uh, particularly caterpillars, spiders. 
So it's really important to have cover um, for those, those creatures. Uh, it's important to have sedges, important to have the, the herbaceous species. And I'm not, you see, I'm not giving you specific species because it's, it's kind of countless and it depends on the, on the environment, but um, you want to have those cool season species because let's just say it's a prairie situation. You know, prairies are late. Uh, you know, they come up for the warm season and then they maximize their potential July moving forward, right? And they bloom often in August and, and late July and September and so on. But there are some cool season species and those are important to bring in and they support all kinds of um, cater caterpillars. Um, and, and so that's important forage. Uh, so get those cool, spe cool season species in. Often the cool season species will set seed earlier um, so if it's uh, something like June grass or um, a, a number of the cool season sedges, their little nutlets and everything are up in June, right? So that's early, early forage besides the, the caterpillars and, and, and things like that, the insects that the, um, the birds might eat. July is tough, like from the aesthetic point of view, uh, the human aesthetic point of view. I had a guy who's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm really trying to fill out July. There's not a lot of things blooming in July in my yard. And, and I was like, well, how about, you know, Monarda fistulosa? No, I already have that. You know, and, and, and so the problem becomes something different. It becomes very human. Like, well, you already have that. Right? Like, I already have that. I'm like, but there's not a lot in July, you know, and there's a few flowering species, um, you know, so given your conditions, Given the, the the time frame that most prairie species are working over, there's going to be down period, and surely insects and so on evolved with those things and have sort of a timing about them with that. Uh, seed heads obviously are really uh, September October moving through the winter. I mean, I see. You know, a lot of bird lovers put out like, you know, sunflower seeds and all this kind of stuff, right? Like all those seeds that they put out, they're fatty, they're this, they're that. Um, and they're not native plant seeds necessarily. And when I watch birds on our native plants here, the things that are sticking up out of the snow or just because it's, you know, it's brown season, it's November, and they're going after them. Uh, it's a lot of cone flowers. They love the cone flowers. Um, those seed heads, if you do narrow, um, uh, narrow leaf cone flower, they come up pretty early those seed heads are not too late in the season. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really complex because there's so many different conditions to, to be bouncing your plant choices off of. And I, I think maybe it's important to make some basic choices and observe what's happening in your yard and then bolster those choices with those observations. Um, so anyway, if that, reveals a certain amount of ignorance I have to what will feed those species across a whole, I mean, bird species across a whole year. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I witness birds eating insects in our, um, in our backyard and they're, you know, they're going after flies like the Eastern Phoebes, you know, they're um, the Phoebes they they love the flies and that happens in July. And but it doesn't happen before July and it doesn't happen after July. It happens when the the um the deer flies are hovering, right? They go and they swipe down to get it. I see things like um black cap chickadees, you know, on the um on the uh, cone flowers out front. And that but that doesn't happen until November, right? And a lot of the bird species are gone. Um yeah, anyway, so my observations are mostly based on my own environment. Berry, I, I really think it's important to have uh, shrubs that produce berries. And, and, but that can get tricky because, you know, like winterberry, it's a popular one. Humans love it. It's got the aesthetic potential through the winter. It holds onto those red berries. But if you don't get male and female shrubs, you're not going to get berries if none of your neighbors have any, right? So they get, you get into these little tricky, tricky places. Um, I think dogwoods are great. They hold on to the berries for a good long time. And the leaves are really, um, any, any number of dogwood shrubs are important for a lot of uh, caterpillars. 
of course, everybody knows Doug Tallamy, and you know he's big on oak trees. If you have oak trees, you're feeding everything. Um, you know, blue jays love acorns, especially the ones that are crunched up by the by the deer that come through that mash them up a little bit. Great. Well, I think we're at the end of our time here today. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much, Frank, for for being here today and. Marion, do you have any other closing remarks? Um, just to thank everyone for coming, I um, posted Frank's contact information and the Shelterwood Gardens website address in the chat, as well as the link to our upcoming events. We have some spring outings as well as our April webinar, and we hope to see you soon. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.